Welcome everyone to today's webinar. Uh, this is uh, our first webinar in our series titled Open Source for Associations, What You Need to Know. My name is Kim Turner and I'll be moderating our discussion today. I'm excited today to be kicking off this first webinar in our series titled, What is Open Source? Why is it so popular? And why should associations care? Uh, we're seeing a very important shift occurring in, uh, in, in the development uh, around uh, standards, in particular in traditional SSOs, seeing a need to understand and collaborate with open source projects and open source software development. And the industry is certainly driving uh, a, a new model to develop standards as well as bring in open source software for, I think, what a lot of people would, would say is faster publication, faster time to market uh, for, for standards. So this has been an incredibly exciting time over the last probably year or two, seeing a lot of organizations uh, try to handle the convergence between open source software and standards development. I'm excited today to be joined by two individuals, Joaquin Prado and Michelle Herman, both with extensive backgrounds in open source and standards development, and they will help us begin our journey to highlight and understand both open source standards organizations and give us an intro into the real-time issues SSOs uh, are dealing with. And when I say SSOs, I'm referring to uh, any sorts of organization out there that develops specifications and, and publishes them. Uh, there are many different types of SSOs, and so uh, we are um, looking at those in, in the general sense. <clears throat> Our session today is going to open with uh, Joaquin, who will give us a background on some of the challenges that traditional SSOs are facing to accommodate open source software development and collaboration under their current models. Uh, they are seeing some interesting challenges to drive development and, and adoption of their standards under their traditional governance models. We'll then shift over to Michelle to give a brief primer on, on uh, open source software and then begin to define some of the legal issues that traditional SSOs are facing in order to accommodate open source software. Each presenter is going to speak for roughly 15 to 20 minutes, and then we will go ahead and open the floor for Q&A. Uh, we are using the GoToWebinar software, and there is a chat window. Uh, the chat window is the best place to put in your questions, should you have them. Uh, and we will go ahead and uh, look at some of those questions and try to get through as many as we can with the time that's left. So with that, I uh, am going to ask Joaquin uh, to start on, on his presentation. But before we do that, I uh, want to give a brief background. Joaquin is, the, is currently the Director of Technical Programs at the Open Mobile Alliance. Prior to joining OMA, Joaquin worked for Vodafone, where he uh, planned, defined, developed, and implemented new products and services which transitioned over into his work in OMA. Joaquin is responsible for formalizing a series of program improvements across the organization, in particular programs ranging from lowering the cost of running the OMA work program to bringing in new tools and technologies like GitHub, XML validation tools. And he's also the uh, owner and creator uh, of the execution of all of the OMA test fest. So welcome, Joaquin. And I think you have some slides you'd like to present. Thank you very much, Hank. So let's go to, first of all, I hope you can hear me correctly. I have uh, previously some challenges with audio. Yes. Okay. Yep, we can hear you just so, fine. So what I try, uh, the things I'm going to show today is, in a way, is, is our experience um, in, in terms of how we are coping with the, the challenge of, of Working standards organizations, sorry, with open source organizations, and this is very specific, specifically to our, our, uh, to ourselves. So people may find that uh, in some areas they can agree or disagree, and that will be good to to open for discussion. So my title for today is about what traditional standards organizations can learn from open source organizations, and I would like to start first with the open source, and when I'm going to give. Uh, Two slides are simple, and the difference in how the open source collaborate versus open source to 
uh, close, uh, close source, I would say. So the, the open source organizations, the main purpose is collaboration. And it represents a model for people to work together, building something greater that they can create on their own. But if you think about it, the standard development organizations, or SDOs, is exactly the same. But the open source, they do it a little bit different. And in the next slide, I, I would like to first to give you an, an introduction to what is coming in the next slide. And here is that you have an open source organization where you have members. Uh, some of these members, they are the leaders. And other ones are just members that they can contribute to the open source or to the code. And then you have the community. These are no members. They have an interest. And they have, uh, they have problems they want to resolve on that particular code that is being standardized. And then I, I, it's important this slide because you will see later how a transition of a particular um, uh, code move from closed to open source and you will see the difference in collaboration. So when you have the members, uh, those they have, uh, the leaders of the organization that they can have uh, right access, which means they can do direct changes to the open source, or sorry, to the, to the code itself, we call that commit push. If the members, they don't have that uh, right access directly into the code, in that case, we could pull requests. And that pull request, it goes to a process of discussion and the leader of the group, if they agree with the changes, it will be merged into the code. Now, this is internal. When it goes external, it works in a very similar uh, fashion. But now what you have is normally, the problems start with the issues. The community raise a problem. That problem normally triggers some comments. You can see here. The comments is that someone, and normally different from who raised the issue, creates a chain, what is called pull request. That pull request it generates comments, and eventually someone goes and provides a review and is submitted for discussion. This discussion, as you can see, is under the control of the organization, and if they consider that the, the changes that are suggested into the code make sense, in that case, is merged into this uh, code. And therefore, the organization can benefit out of this. So I will say straight away, the difference between the standard development organizations and open source is in the standard development organizations, at least the one I represent, all the work is happening mainly in this area. In the one is graded in, in gray. We have a very little interaction normally with the external. And obviously, this external community is the ones that have the problem. So let's go to see now an example of a particular uh, code. It's, this uh, was created by Microsoft. It's a .NET compiler platform. And what you can see here is that uh, initially, this uh, code was developed internally inside of Microsoft. And this slide here represents, or this uh, the vertical represents the number of interactions, the number of issues, the number of pull requests, the number of changes that are happening internally. At a certain point, Microsoft decided to make this code public. They put it in a public area, in this case in GitHub, and they allow the community to contribute. Now you can see the difference. There were a lot of people interested in this particular topic, on this particular code. They have problems. They start issuing comments or bugs or challenges, you know, problems that they were founding. And this starts driving what we call the comments from the other community. The comments from the community eventually drive into someone prepare some code changes. Those code changes were reviewed and eventually were implemented. And you can see the volume of interaction and the volume of changes is much better, is much larger once you go open source. So this is one of the benefits of um, when you move your content uh, to the community for them to co provide your feedback and, and help you with the development. The problem here or the challenge is that you 
When you are in a closed environment, you retain total control. When you open it, you lose some control. But at the same time, you have the benefit to harvest this input. And this input is what the industry needs. So that is something that the open source communities, they are able to harvest quite well. So now let's go to see our experience in the standards development organizations, SDOs, and uh, our organization has been in place for 15 years. Our output is a PDF. We provide PDF which contain technical information. They can be later trans uh, trans uh, translated into code, and that code is implemented in a client or in a server in software. Mm -hmm. So our output is just PDF. We don't have normally uh, samples of code. We don't develop any tools for the developers. Uh, we get uh, very few feedback before we start this process or open to the developers. And uh, we didn't get any really um, comments back from the, from the developers telling us this is the problem or, or how we are going to deal with this particular situation. If you see on the other side what the developer, developers' needs are, they need uh, test servers, they need code, they need forums, they need online documentation, they need tools that uh, sometimes in the particular uh, service or protocol they're developing, they find some challenges and someone say, we need to have this tool, someone offer the services and start developing, and someone follow up and help. And at the same time, they need uh, the challenges, the hackathon. Yeah? And the things they want is they want to resolve issues they are having in their daily, uh, daily work. So obviously, you can see there is a, a gap in the middle. And we thought, OK, how we are going to fill that gap? Initially, we went for the, the concept of the developer toolkit. And they said, OK, what is the developer toolkit? And it's a very, uh, a very high level. It's split it in two sides. One of them is the organization develop tools. The organization is developing tools and is doing things consciously that this is going to be consumed by the developers. So we have white papers, we have the specifications that we try to make it easy for them to consume in the state of PDF into HTML, for example. We create a technical summaries, use cases to explain uh, how these things work, simulators. And then we allow them to submit problems directly from, the, from their communities, from the internet, I would say, directly into our organization. And then we provide test events and workshops. The community in, 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 on, on their side, they organize in a way to create the open source code. And we have, in, in our case, we have one of the situations where one open source community took our specifications and developed the code. They create sandboxes. They need something to test. So the sandbox allows them to test constantly, as a constant uh, permanent testing ongoing for what they're developing. They need to, in some cases, uh, some of the organizations, they say, um, I have a server, and I'm going to make this server available for testing. And they need to develop tools to resolve a particular issue. And then they need to have a workspace where they go and they discuss about issues, problems that are related with what they try to implement. Most of these issues are not necessarily related with the standard development organization, but some of them they will, and those are the ones you have to pick up and take back into the organization. So our developer toolkit, it has a good success, but then you realize very quickly that uh, that is good, but it's not enough is something missing. And the next slide, we are going to see what is missing. So I would like to step back a little bit here and say the following thing. If an organization cannot generate a sustainable demand of their technical specifications, then you have to reach outside. You have to look for other communities to help you, to assist you, to support you or to take what you have and evolve it. If what you are producing is technical specifications, more than probably that content has to be converted into code. And if it has to be converted into code, the community has, you have to reach is the developers. Now, if you are going to reach the, the developer community, in that case, I have a full, four bullet points on there. 
that you have to be in consideration, or you need to have in consideration. At least that was our case. The first thing is you need to facilitate collaboration. So you have to start using tools that the developers are using. GitHub, Bitbucket, Slack, ways for them to communicate back with you. This is going to give you feedback. It's going to give you issues. It's going to give you problems and comments of things that they see from their side. And you have to be prepared to deal with that. The other thing is that uh, you need to look how they consume your specifications and you need to start removing technical barriers for, for their adoption. Here's where the toolkit comes in and have a, a play. And the other thing is, is more, I will say is more complex in a way at least to achieve, is you need to create an ecosystem. You cannot work only by yourself. In our case, uh, we are working on that, and the way we try to uh, provide a service to the developers is the following thing. We create the ecosystem because uh, once upon a time, our organization, OMA, is 16 years old. At that time, we have all the main, main players in the industry. We did not need to reach outside of our boundaries. Our members implemented what was produced. Nowadays, things have changed. So nowadays, if we want to implement some of our protocols, we have to reach outside. And in that case, we need to start building that ecosystem. The other thing is, when you look internally, you have some challenges in terms of the development of the specifications. You have the, collabor the collaboration, internal collaboration. We are good at that. But then you have to reach to the external collaboration. And there are some challenges on there. The second thing is, what you are aiming for is the adoption of your specifications by the market. Then you are coming with some licenses and you need to figure out how you are going to do that. But adoption at the end of the day is the reason why some of these organizations are put in place because we want that we specify is being consumed by the market. And that is a good thing, but it's not enough. The last step is the evolution. You want the market not to consume only version one, but you want the market to consume version two, version three of your specifications. And in order to do, to do that, you need the feedback from the market because the market in, in, in reality, it may take you to path that you, at the beginning, you were not thinking to go. So how to bring all these things together uh, is something we are working on in, in our organization. And I would like to go now for the challenges that uh, are in each one of these steps. In the development, and you will be probably, some of you, uh, quite related with that, is reduce the overall development costs. Nowadays, any organization has this pressure. You need to do uh, at least the same or more with less resources. So you have to increase the production with escalating the costs. You have to improve the efficiency and the reliability of the specification creation. Uh, the, the group they are developing these specifications, they should focus only in creating these specifications and less in process and issues related with that. The other thing is that they control and specify, uh, simplify sorry, the, the life cycle of the specifications. You need to make sure you add value on each phase in the development and even after the development. Another thing is the adaptability of the specification chain new releases based on feedback from the users. So that is important. In, in, historically for us, the feedback of re, uh, creating the next release of a particular uh, version, uh, sorry, the next version of a particular release is based on the internal uh, input from our members. If your members, they are not large enough, to, they don't have the footprint to create a market, you need to get that feedback from outside. And the other thing is they have to be in an agile collaboration. You know, you need to adopt all the shelf tools. Some of them is what the developers are doing. You need to follow them and you need to communicate with them on the language they speak. In terms of adoption of the specifications, the other challenge that we have here is, in our case, is the PDF format is outdated. Uh, as developers, they like to see a specification or, sorry, a, a technical descriptions online. 
then you need to communicate with the developers and their own tools. So if you want to get feedback from them, you need to start using GitHub, Bitbucket, Slack, Stack Overflow, where you, at least you can pay attention on there what they say. The other thing, as a standard development organizations, we have to break this ivory tower syndrome. You, we need to build the ecosystem. We transcend, and this is something that goes beyond only us. We have to reach out to the community. And we need to promote uh, promote that feedback. The other thing is about uh, a build an end user base. You create all these uh, distribution channels uh, where through meetups, uh, through universities, uh, through chat rooms, you are putting your voice out there. You are giving them the tools on how to adopt your specifications. In some cases, simulators. In some cases, um, simple tools to do a particular step. And then what you're expecting in return is some of this feedback that will help you to improve your, uh, your specifications. And the other thing is that uh, it's important is to quantify the adoption of the specifications. One of the, the questions that we have quite regularly is that they say, hey, we have this fantastic protocol. In the case of the Internet of Things, we can do all these kind of things. And they say, OK, right, fair enough. How many people is adopting this? So you have to quantify the adoption, and that is very, very challenging in some, in some cases. And then you have to pay attention to the user needs. Uh, you have to identify the, or, or, or break it down in different segments, in different personas, and create a message for each one of them. It's just no developers sometimes. The developers, there are different categories to the developers, but you have as well the developers managers that you need to reach to them. So the creation of use cases, um, is always a, a very way to put uh, in a very simple terms what you try to achieve with a particular uh, service that you're building. And then uh, through the toolkits and APIs, you can uh, facilitate the adoption. And it's, this is very generic what I say here because it depends where you are developing. In our case, we create simulators, we create APIs, and we create documentation that for the developers that they help them to to, to adopt these specifications. The final step here in, in this is the evolution. And the evolution, the challenges you have in the evolution is always the harvest the knowledge of the market. You need to get these back, uh, back issues, these problems, these new use cases, the things that your specifications they don't do. It's always difficult, but you always find someone is willing to provide you that feedback. That the voice of that particular customer, obviously that is the one you need to listen to. Then internally you may decide to go for that or not, but at least that feedback is gone initially. If you don't have it, you don't know where to go. And the other thing is that we we identify as well is to get the instant feedback, who, where, and how they are using your specifications. We don't have at the moment any system to track this, but we are now in the system we are building, we are considering on, on how to track these, uh, who is consuming our specifications and how. And the other thing is, the, the final thing is the ecosystem, and I'm going to give you an example here very quickly. Um, what we have in the ecosystem is that uh, we put a protocol out there in the industry. This protocol, um, we just try to communicated to the, to the industry about the benefits of the protocol, but is one organization doing a protocol in a space that we are not very well known, like in the case of IoT. So what we have done is just to, I mean, uh, the, the things that we have done is we are taking components from other standard development organizations. So we partner with them to make sure that uh, our proposition is not just a protocol, but we are providing the other components that, in, in our case, if you put it together, creates a, a solid uh, product uh, proposition. And in our case, uh, without getting too much technical details, we get the transport from another organization, the research model, and the code uh, coming together uh, based in our specifications. Then the community partners, they evolve from that. Some of them, they start producing test servers. Some of them, they start producing particular uh, platforms that they uh, open to the, uh, to the uh, open source for them to take, and so on. 
And the other thing that is very difficult, and we have some success, but it requires a lot of effort, is to identify the user groups. We have, uh, from time to time, uh, calls coming from meetups all around the world where they tell us, hey, could you please provide us a, a workshop based on your specifications? We are collaborating with, uh, with universities. They have programs in, the, in this particular case, in the IoT space, where um, they are now incorporating in the, in the syllabus, in the, their um, program, our protocol. So the students are studying our protocol. And this is creating challenges because they need, obviously, some kind of um, uh, uh, tools and explanations that are very basic for them. The other thing is we have test fest as well that we organize. And we are considering have some kind of certification, uh, which is important as well. And then the Stack Overflow is, uh, for the developers, it's a place where they go and they ask questions. I don't say that uh, the standards they need to move into a Stack Overflow, the standards development organizations, but what I say is important to listen what they comment on that. 95% of the comments are going to be irrelevant for what we do. But 5% could be the next, you know, the next clue for how to evolve the next version of the specifications. And then you have to create training materials and all of that. So with that, I have complete. I think I probably was just over my time. So that's yeah, my did it. Thank you, Joaquin. Yes, you did a fantastic time, or a fantastic job staying uh, on time. Uh, and I think um, the descriptions that you've provided of, of the tools and reminders about the importance of collaborating uh, with uh, the difference between, uh, you know, a PDF document, uh, otherwise known as a standard and, and code, and how do you bridge that gap? You gave us a very great intro into uh, some of the, the challenges and, and things we need to think about. Uh, with that, uh, the question always comes up with, well, are there other things we need to think about uh, in the realm of traditional standards bodies? And, and I think the answer to that is, yes, we absolutely need to look at some other pieces, in particular legal structure and, and governance. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Michelle Herman. Um, Michelle is currently the founder and CEO of Just Tech Law PLLC, which is a consulting firm specializing in collaborative technical development including interoperability standards and, and open source. Uh, prior to that position, Michelle was chief counsel for Intellectual Ventures Invention Science Fund, which provided strategic advice and legal oversight for the company's innovation programs. And prior to that, she has numerous, lots of years of experience uh, working as a partner in two different law firms and associate general counsel at Microsoft, all focusing on technology standards, open source software, patent, and technology licensing. So with that, Michelle, I'd like to turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Kim. Um, I'm hoping everyone can see my slides. Um, I also want to thank Virtual for uh, organizing and hosting these series of webinars. Uh, Joaquim uh, did a fantastic job um, describing and discussing the importance of open source communities, engagement, standards development, and adoption. And that's a fantastic lead-in for um, what I want to talk about, which is some of the legal issues or challenges that arise in connection with those interactions. So when I think about open source, I often think about this slogan, you know, free as in freedom, not free as in free beer. Um, they really are very different. Um, when we think about, um, you know, free beer, you get your beer, you can do whatever you want with it, drink it, spill it on the floor, whatever you want to do. Um, Freedom is a little bit different. I think about freedom, for example, in the context of like our constitution where we are granted, you know, freedom of speech. You know, there are strings attached, it's not absolute. And, you know, others, other governments, for example, don't have to honor our freedom. So I often think about open source in, in that context um, to help understand what the free part means. So in the context of standards and, uh, interactions with open source communities, um, I want to start out with a few, um, you know, very basic. The participants in standard setting organizations um, typically are required to 
commit to license um, their standards essential patent claims. Those are claims that would be infringed when you implement the standard on um, reasonable non-discriminatory terms, which you'll hear RAND, or fair reasonable non-discriminatory terms, which you'll hear FRAN. These are used interchangeably. Um, it used to be um, just that RAND was used in the US and FRAN was used in Europe, and now most people say FRAN. They're the same thing for our purposes of our discussion. But a FRAN commitment is, is really, it's not, it's not an actual license, it's just that it's a commitment, and the idea is that those participants making those commitments would, those patent holders would negotiate uh, patent licenses with implementers on a bilateral basis. So each, each you know, the patent owner with each indivi individual implementer would go off and negotiate the license if it was needed. And like any other patent license, these brands licenses have lots of terms and conditions. They may include some type of uh, monetary compensation in many varieties and forms. Um, the issue though, when we're dealing with the open source of community's engagement and involvement in standard setting is they're, they're spending their time and resources developing implementations with expectations that they're gonna be free. And now they might have to go off and negotiate patent licenses with patent holders. And this has created an enormous amount of tension. And um, so what we're gonna look at is, you know, is this, is this tension a, a true legal problem or is it just an expectation problem and irrespective, how do we deal with it? And I'm gonna say that this is not a new problem. This goes back to um, very early days and I'm gonna give you some, you know, a little bit of a war story to um, sort of highlight the tension that's involved. Back in October of 2001, I was part of a W3C working group that was developing the W3C's first patent policy. At the time, they didn't have a stated policy, had had a few issues, which made them believe that they needed one. And so they formed a working group with, you know, um, a number of uh, members corporate counsel and W3 staff, three c staff. And as typical of most patent policies at the time, um, it was based on a, a, a RAND or FRAND framework. Um, the W3C posted that initial proposed policy for public comment. They wanted to hear what the community thought about it. Well, they heard in a really big way. Within about two days after the um, patent, po the proposed policy was posted, they received more than 1,500 um, comments, many of them irate and very hateful. And um, I, I, had the, I hadn't looked at these in many, many years, this is 16 years ago, but I, I was able to find, and I, it's at this link, the whole series of these um, comments, and many of them were personal. I have on the next slide one just to highlight sort of the nature of these, these comments. This was like the second one I came across. So the W3C has a virus. This is called commercial sex with Fortune 500. I think the W3C board members are corrupt. The RAND license is just a renamed tool for the Microsoft Standards Group. And as you can see, I was at the time representing Microsoft Standards Group. So um, many of them were um, personal and you know really showed the outrage of the community in the context of, you know, hey, we want to do free software and we want to be able to release implementations under open source, and now you want us to sign patent licenses and pay, you know, potentially pay royalties. So, um, as a result of this outpouring, or if you will, uh, browbeating from that that we all received from the um, open source community, there were three open source community representatives invited to participate in the working group, and ultimately the W3C adopted a royalty-free policy. Um, there were other RAM terms and conditions that um, patent owners could include in their royalty-free licenses, but they were royalty-free. And if uh, you, if those on the call, if you participate in the next webinar, um, I will also tell a war story about um, a royalty-free license that was really still not acceptable um, to the open source community. So um, the point is, even the royalty-free version may not. Um, provide enough insurance or enough comfort to the open source community engaging with standards development. So um, let's talk a little bit about the open source licenses so that we can try to understand if, if they're really, if this is just sort of a 
expectation issue or if this is actually true legal incompatibility. So open source software is simply software that is distributed under an open source license. Now there's a lot of ways to think about what an open source license is. And, and you know, um, Joaquin talked a, a bit about how uh, open source communities develop open source, you know, in this sort of a pro open process. But at the end of the day, what makes it open source software is, is really the license it's distributed under. So the open source initiative has come up with a definition called the open source definition. It has 10 criteria in which they vet licenses against those 10 criteria. And if they meet the 10 criteria, they, they certify them as open source licenses. Doesn't mean other licenses can't be open source, but this is a useful tool for thinking about what is an open source license. I'm not going to spend um, all of our time talking about all of those different criteria, but I wanted to hit a couple that I think are important to our discussion today. The first is that the license, when you distribute that open source software, it has to be royalty free. It doesn't mean you can't charge somebody for the actual copy, the physical copy, but the, the IP license has to be royalty free. It has to allow the modifications and redistribution for free. And it can't require that the recipient signs a license agreement. And that includes click through. So you can't even click I accept. So what that means is the license is usually embedded with the code. And most developers who receive uh, open, download an open source program, they may not even know that there's a license there or that it has any terms or conditions associated with it. It may not know about the strings that are attached. And so um, it doesn't mean, though, that there are none. And I, on this next slide, I, you know, I went up to the OSI site and I just looked at a number of um, fairly commonly used um, different open source licenses and hit print to see how many pages they would come out to be. And the point here isn't so much how long or short they are, but if it really meant free as in free beer, it wouldn't take this many pages to say that. So the point is, there really are lots of terms and conditions in many of these agreements that are important to understand. And so with that, we need to look at the different kinds of licenses and the different kinds of terms and conditions that they impose to understand the interplay between these licensing requirements and these FRAND licensing uh, commitments that are um, undertaken in connection with standards development. So open source licenses can be, at a very high level, uh, divided into two broad categories. Um, you have permissive licenses, and they're permissive because the only thing you need to do to comply with them is reproduce the copyright right notice and, and the license itself when you distribute the code. You could even distribute the code under your own license. Then there's another category called the reciprocal or copyleft licenses. They also require you to reproduce the copyright notice and the license. They also require you to make source code available. You don't have to necessarily distribute the source code, but you got to make it available. And then when you redistribute that open source code, you got to redistribute it under the same open source license, or in some cases, the compatible one. And within these copyleft licenses, there's, there's what we call strong ones and weaker ones. And the weaker ones say if you modify or add to this open source code, your modifications and additions or maybe the files that contain the open source code also have to be released under these open source licenses, which means when you have to make source code available, you have to make it available for free and all those other things. And the stronger copyleft licenses say all that, but they also may mean if you have a proprietary program and you just, all you do is link to a uh, open source program under one of these licenses, your proprietary program may, may now have to be also distributed under the same open source license means, um, for, you know, royalty free, no license, um, make the source code available. So these kinds of terms um, are important in understanding where some of the frictions lie between uh, these FRAND commitments that participants in standards development undertake in connection with the distribution of open source. So let's talk for a minute about when software is actually a standard or is a part of it. So, you know, most standards organizations um, really don't want to include um, code in their, in their specifications at all. And they certainly usually 
number one, standardized on the actual software implementation. And the reason for that is the idea around technical specification is that um, many different vendors can go implement it in their own way. They can have independent implementations and then they can compete with each other. But if you standardize on the implementation itself, in other words, the software code, then you only have one conformant implementation and therefore there's little or you're impeding competition around implementation of the standard. And that raises any trust concerns that standards organizations typically want to avoid. The other problem, even if you only Put in parts of the code, in other words, snippets of code, you have this issue because standards organizations do typically have a copyright policy with regard to their specific, excuse me, specifications. And the specific and those copyright policies usually they don't want forking of the specifications. So they usually only grant a copyright license so that the spec can be copied in full and there's no modifications to it. Well, if you put code in the specification, you need to be able to extract that code, copy it to use it into your in your products, and probably adapt it for your commercial product. So now you need a whole different kind of copyright license than the spec license. And most organizations, most standards organizations, don't have that type of policy, and many of them don't even um, haven't even really fully thought about that. So they typically just want to stay away from code. The other problem you have is particularly with these open source code contributions, if they're coming in under a copyleft license, we just talked about how they have to be redistributed under the same license and modifications and additions and potentially proprietary programs distributed with them would also come under those copyleft licenses. And that might be a really big problem for the standards participants who, who may or may not want to implement their um, the standards using those particular um, software licenses, in this case, open source software licenses. So I want to take a second to um, just distinguish between the open um, and open standards and the open and open source. For standards, what we're really talking about in open standards is this open process, the notion that anyone can participate and anyone can provide feedback. For software, despite the fact that there may be communities out there developing software with an open process, again, think about open source software simply means software that's distributed under an open source license. You could have a community that develops um, software in an open process and they could slap a proprietary license on that software and despite the fact that it was an open community development process, if it has a proprietary license associated with its distribution, it's not going to be open source. Software and standards are also typically different in other ways. The standard, as we've been talking about, is, is really a, a description of required, you know, um, features or um, required elements that enable interoperability or compatibility. Um, it can be, those can be implemented in any number of different ways by different um, vendors. Software is just that, it's software, and open source software is just software that's distributed under an open source license. So standards actually can be implemented in, in software. Some developers may distribute that, that software, that implementation under an open source license, while others might choose a different kind of license. So what we see in the marketplace is implementations of the standard under both um, open source licenses as well as other licenses like proprietary and commercial licenses. So um, I have a, you know, uh, Joaquin had actually gone through something similar like, uh, you know, in terms of how do the communities engage, what is the interaction. What I want to do is sort of focus on the, some of these licensing issues in the context of that interaction. So in the, set, in the standards organization, we'll develop a draft specification. Typically, the participants have these brand commitments for their essential patent claims. Um, developers, and in this case, we'll say developers in open source communities will develop implementations and test those implementations. Now, they're doing so under uh, an open source license regime. And then they're going to provide that feedback back to the standards organization who's going to address that feedback. And the standards organization is going to get feedback from other implementation and testing. 
Now they could get code directly and include it in the specification. I just said that they typically don't do that, but it happens. Sometimes the code is in the specification. Other times the feedback um, comes in the way of you look at the implementation and the test results and you know identification of problems. And you know, these communities can send in descriptive contributions like new requirements or changes to the requirements in the draft spec. And and those end up in the final specification adopted by the standards organization. So when we think about this now, we have open source developers who've now, you know, embraced the notion of developing a standard. They've um, spent a lot of time and effort developing uh, implementations and testing them, and giving feedback. And the last thing they really want to find out is that these implementations that now conform to the standard are potentially subject to, um, you know, FRAN licensing negotiations and possible royalties with patent holders. So we're going to look at, is there really a legal incompatibility between the open source licensing model and the FRAN patent commitment? So the open source licensing uh, model, you know, it basically says that you can't charge a royalty or fee when you distribute the um, implementation of the standard under the open source license. It doesn't say that you also guarantee that there's nobody else out there that has maybe patents that you might be required to license. And in fact, some open source licenses actually say that. Similarly, um, when you distribute an open source implementation, you can't require your recipients to um, sign or accept the license agreement. But you're not guaranteeing that there's nobody else out there that won't come and say, hey, you have to take a license agreement from me because I've got some other IT. So what does this actually mean? So if you are the software developer in this sort of diagram, when you distribute an open source implementation, you can't charge anybody a royalty or fee, and you can't ask anybody to sign an agreement. But if there's somebody else out here who has a uh, patent that's subject to a trans license commitment, well, they can come to you and they can say, you know, you have to negotiate a license with me. That license may or may not cover all of your downstream recipients, if assuming you took it. Um, so maybe some of the downstream recipients may also have to take a license with this third party patent owner. And again, this is something that um, a lot of open source uh, developers and communities, you know, really don't want to see. Um, now I said there's no clear incompatibility there between the licenses and the, the FRAN licensing regime. But I do have to point out this provision in the GPL, which is a really common um, open source license. And basically the part I highlighted in red says, look, if you would need a, a patent license and it's not royalty free for everybody else, then you can't comply with this license if you distribute code under it. Now, I don't know how a court would interpret that because we don't, as far as I know, there have been no courts that have interpreted that provision. So what we have done, I mean, this has been an issue for years and years and years. Um, but we can look at, well, what's going on out there? How, how do patent licenses affect distribution of GPL code? So I would suggest to you we have several areas of evidence to say, well, even if there is a legal incompatibility here, um, there's evidence that the industry just works it out, okay? Um, so for example, lots of big operating companies have cross licenses with each other, or other companies um, provide portfolio licenses to operating companies. Uh, I'm talking about all patent licenses here. They require royalties and other fees. The, the licensees involved here do distribute um, GPL code, and the those licenses are almost shortly not sufficient to apply to all downstream recipients. But we haven't seen them shut down because they don't have the patent rights to do so. There have also been a number of noted um, settlements with uh, patent litigation settlements with Linux distributors. Now they've managed to continue to distribute Linux despite having to settle patent litigation, um, meaning that they have the rights to do that. They probably don't have the rights for all downstream recipients, and if they do, they've worked out a deal to get those. So, um, you know, just another data point. And then finally, back in about 2008, um, 
we started to see an enormous amount of patent litigation around uh, smartphones. Um, and these include smartphones based on the Android operating system. I just put in like three cases here, you know, from a long time ago, but there are actually dozens and dozens of patent cases. The fact that there are Android infringes at least some of these, some of the patents asserted in, in these cases has not meant that they've been unable to distribute, you know, phones with Android operating system. So again, we have another data point that even with the GPL, um, it is quite possible to um, envision where brand licensing commitments and open source distribution can actually coexist. We haven't really seen um, actual legal issues arising from that. That doesn't mean that the tension's not there. Um, and I realize I have to quick hurry up. So I will say that there are some other, <laughs> there are some other um, areas of tension, which I, I, I won't go in here because I really didn't have time to explore, but I didn't want people to think that these were the only areas of tension. And then finally, I will make a plug for our, our, uh, a later webinar where we're going to talk about, well, how do you, so whether it's a legal incompatibility or not, how do we deal with the tension? Um, or do we deal with the tension? And um, there's some possible solutions and we'll explore them in a later webinar. And with that, I will end. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I, I actually um, have a question for you and then uh, I have a, also have a follow-up for Joaquin. So Michelle, uh, open source typically refers to source code and it's conceptually pretty simple. For example, here is source code, you can use it at no charge. And I think you had, had uh, gone over that a little bit in your presentation. So the question is, uh, when we are developing a specification, there is text and there are ideas described by that text. The open source license is much less confined. Do you think we can actually apply OSS licenses to specifications? And are the, are the ideas also free to use? So I, I, there's a lot of issues in there. Um, I, I don't think um, an open source license is good for technical specification because the technical specification is about the document itself, whereas the open source license is about software. And you do different things with a document versus the software. With the software, you know, you compile it, maybe you modify it, and, and then you compile it and run it. Um, you integrate it into products, you combine it with other code. The, the document license for the specification